restaurant without natural gas. But before then, we're also gonna learn about this ordinance that we are proposing so that people can understand what it will do and what it won't do. So with that, I just wanna say thank you all for taking the time to join us, for taking the time to learn, and for taking the time to give us your thoughts and your feedback about this very important work. Thank you, and back to Cindy. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and for anyone who just joined us and would like to um, hear this meeting either in Spanish or Chinese, we have put directions in the chat. Um, our translators are already in separate rooms, so I can't bring them back right now, but I'll repeat that a couple times as we move forward. Um, and so I would like to just thank everyone for joining us today. I especially want to thank people from the restaurant industry that took the time to come and listen to us. Um, we understand this is an incredibly challenging time uh, for everyone during the pandemic, but I, we know the restaurant industry has been hit particularly hard. And so we thank you for taking this time to learn more about this ordinance and we're really humble to have your participation. Um, so what we're gonna do is I am going to start off um, with a brief presentation about climate impacts and a little bit of background about the ordinance. And then as Debbie said, I'm gonna turn it over to two experts we have with us today to talk about all electric cooking um, and setting up kitchens. And we have set um, a large amount of time to, to answer your questions and hear your concerns. And so what we're gonna be doing today is that we will be recording the presentation part of this of this webinar but we will not be recording any questions and answers so if you don't want people to know you're here no one will know we've just invited these incredible experts and we want to make sure we have an opportunity to share um, the information they bring with other people um, so with that i'm going to get started i'm going to share my screen and uh start the presentation Okay, so just in June, Supervisor Mandelman, who is a member of the Board of Supervisors, introduced legislation to eliminate natural gas from new construction. Um, and this proposed ordinance we're gonna talk about today is only for new construction. Um, it doesn't apply to occupancy changes, additions or alterations. Um, so that's just important to note. This is really going into the future looking at the new restaurants that we'll be constructing. Um, and while Supervisor Mandelman's office started doing outreach to restaurants in February, this outreach was sharply curtailed because of COVID and the pandemic. And so today we're really here to discuss the ordinance and focus on restaurants and some of the challenges and benefits. So I'm gonna give you um, kind of a brief overview of, of why we're doing this in the first part. And, one of the biggest reasons is around climate impacts to San Francisco. So this picture might look familiar to most of us in the city. Um, and today we know that climate change is accelerating faster than we expected. And in February of 2019, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors declared a climate emergency. Um, and our climate is changing and it's, it's really putting our communities at risk. For example, this year we've already had 48 days of poor air quality. So in addition to the projected temperature changes, flooding, severe storms, and we still have another month of wildfire season. Um, this is really impacting our infrastructure, our communities, our natural resources, and our public health. And by reducing the city's emissions and preparing for climate impacts, um, the city will be able to protect our health and the well-being of citizens and our economy. And while everyone on this call will be impacted by climate change, we know that our communities of color and low-income communities will be most impacted. So how is San Francisco doing combating climate change? So San Francisco has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions or its climate pollution um, about 35% from 1990 levels. So we have been making progress. Um, but to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change, Mayor Breed, along with many cities around the world, 
have committed to net zero emissions by 2050. So let's take a look at the next slide to see what that looks like. So this slide shows where we need to go to get to our 2050 emission goals. So the orange circle kind of depicts where we are today and the green line shows the emission reductions that are necessary to achieve our city's climate goals and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And that red data line is kind of where we don't want to go. Um, and if we just continued uh, as business as usual without making the changes. So we kind of know where we need to go. And the next question is, is how? So to answer the question how, we are driven by data. So this slide shows our most current greenhouse gas inventory or where our climate pollution is coming from. So building emissions represent almost half of our city's energy pollution, so about 44%. So commercial and residential building impacts are really dominated by natural gas. Um, and 82% 80 of building emissions stem from the use of natural gas, which is from space heating, cooling, hot water, cooking, and other uses. So this slide makes it clear that as a city, we need to do something about natural gas. So today we're gonna to discuss how we move away from natural gas and why. Um, and you may be asking yourself, geez, I remember natural gas being a clean burning fuel. And many years ago, natural gas was seen as a cleaner source of energy compared to coal. But now we've phased out with coal. And now that there is not any coal, we need to move away from natural gas towards renewable energy. That includes solar, wind, hydro, et cetera. Um, natural gas emits both carbon dioxide and methane, which contribute to climate change. And really without the elimination of natural gas, we cannot achieve our climate action goals. So as we move towards eliminating natural gas, a term we use um, is building electrification. So moving towards clean electricity. And there's many benefits of electrification beyond just the climate impacts. So natural gas, if many of you don't know, is bad for our health. Um, the air pollutants in natural gas are linked to both acute and chronic health effects, such as respiratory illness, asthma, and premature death. And this impacts people in our houses, but also our workers in our restaurants. Um, natural gas impacts safety. Um, natural gas is a combustible material. Um, and we continue to see time and time again explosions from natural gas. In February of 2019 in San Francisco, we saw an explosion um, in the corner of Bury and Parker that is shown in the slide. Um, just in August, we saw a natural gas explosion in Baltimore that leveled three houses and um, killed two people. And we can't forget San Bruno, which happened about 10 years ago, where we had eight deaths and an entire neighborhood was demolished. Um, natural gas also impacts our resilience. Um, we in San Francisco are prone to earthquakes. And so after earthquakes, about half of the fires come from natural gas. And also if we look at uh, utility restoration time after a 7.9 earthquake, we know that we can restore electricity in about a week and it could be up to six months for natural gas. And lastly, for low income communities and communities of color that are more likely to suffer um, from asthma due to poor air quality, uh, zero emission homes and buildings really offer an important opportunity to deliver equity benefits. Um, so next I'm going to talk about our all electric new construction ordinance. Um, and I just want to pause real quick for those of you who joined us a little late and would like to hear this presentation either in Spanish or Chinese. Um, there are instructions in the chat um, to enter into those rooms that will be presenting in those languages. So given our climate goals and dangerous impacts of natural gas, um, Supervisor Mandelman's office set a directive to develop an ordinance to eliminate natural gas from new construction. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one very key 
part of this ordinance is that it's only for new construction and it will not impact any existing buildings or restaurants. Um, I also would like to stop right now and introduce my colleague, Barry Hooper. He is our senior green building specialist. Um, he has worked um, with uh, me, Charles Sheehan, and Supervisor Mandelman's office to help develop this ordinance. Um, and he will be available to answer questions afterwards in a couple slides. So I wanna just quickly give an overview of the process that we use to develop this legislation. Um, this slide gives a synopsis of all the different activities that took place in the development of this ordinance um, and our ongoing engagement. And while I won't go through any of these items in detail, um, we're happy to answer questions and you can find all this different types of material either on the city website and our website. Um, and after this, presentation is ended, we will make sure to send these slide decks to everyone. And if you see the very tiny web links um, in the bottom, you can, you can copy them to make sure you can find the documents that I talked about. So one, to craft this legislation, um, we did bring together participants from many different perspectives, which included community and neighborhood advocacy groups, affordable housing developers, commercial and residential owners, investors, design professionals, um, workforce, labor, lots of different people. We had uh, many working group sessions and we also had a task force that oversaw the development of this ordinance. Um, we have uh, created a report that documents our outreach efforts that is on our website. Um, in addition, we have completed an equity analysis. We have looked at uh, cost impacts by collating information from the state codes and standards program and also information that we have received from developers on all electric buildings. Um, we are going through this legislative process as we speak. Um, so to let you know, this legislation was introduced in June um, and our next hearing on this legislation will be Monday, October 19th. Um, at 1.30 p.m. at the Land Use and Transportation Committee. And then our goal is really to continually engage stakeholders in forums like this. And today we're really interested in hearing more from you about the ordinance. And lastly, that contact information, that number is not my phone number, that is the file number of the legislation. Sometimes when you're trying to find legislation through the city process, it's a little challenging. Um, and so, Everything I've talked about, you can find on our website with reports, and again, we'll be happy to answer questions. So let's dive into the key components of the legislation next. So there are five key components of this ordinance um, that we'd like people to know about. So the first is for projects that apply for building permits after January 1st, 2022, uh, 2021, excuse me, um, Heating, cooling, water heating, cooking, and clothes drying must be all electric. So typically when you put a building permit in, it's about two to three years before construction starts. Um, unfortunately, we have a pretty slow process in San Francisco. So that means for people submitting and building permits for new construction projects, we'll probably see them breaking ground in about two years. Um, once a permit is issued for an all electric building, it can't be converted back to a mixed fuel building. And one really important uh, component to talk about is that for projects that include a co commercial food service establishment, such as a restaurant, uh, mixed fuel building permits will be continue to be accepted to January 1st, 2022, um, making, uh, provided that gas piping is for cooking only. Um, there is an exception process, so mixed fuel permits may be issued um, if all electric construction is either physically or technically infeasible for a specific area or system. And lastly, you know, if there is a mixed fuel permit that is issued, and just to um, clarify, the term mixed fuel means a building built with natural gas, you would have to make that building electric ready. So, or that system. So that means that there would have to be electric wiring so the building can be converted to all electric in the future. Um, so those are the main components of our ordinance. Um, I would like to mention a couple aspects around restaurants. Um, so we, uh, even though the, as the ordinance as proposed right now, it would go into effect in January 
1st, 2021, um, we've provided an extra year for restaurants so we can uh, continue to do um, more specific and targeted outreach. At the last land use committee hearing, there were a couple potential amendments that were uh, introduced. One that would allow legacy businesses, um, if they were being rebuilt in new buildings, um, they could continue to be built with natural gas for a certain amount of time. There was a discussion about extending that timeline. So instead of the building permits being issued January 1st, 2022, extending that a couple years. And then lastly, having a more defined waiver process for restaurants that need um, a, a flame to cook with. So those are the key components of the ordinance. Um, I wanna uh, stop right there and uh, take an opportunity to open it up for questions of anything that we've talked about. All electric kitchens and cooking in them. So first I'd like to introduce Richard Young. Um, Richard Young is an electrical engineer at the, and he is also the director of the Food Service Technology Center. Um, and that is a commercial food, food service research and training facility operated by Frontier Energy. Um, Richard, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Cindy, and I apologize to everybody. I meant to start earlier, but I've had a very strange day with both my main computer and my backup computer failing on me. So we're going to cross our fingers and uh, I'm gonna pull up my screen, share the screen and give you a brief um, presentation and talk a little bit about um, the kitchen of the future and electric kitchens and uh, just basically my message is don't panic. This is actually a good thing. It's probably where you're headed anyway. So let me share my screen. And let's see, let's get to the right screen here. So hopefully you are seeing a PowerPoint slide that says building the all electric kitchen. And Cindy, let me know if for any reason that's not the right slide. And as uh, Cindy said, I work at the Food Service Technology Center and we have been studying commercial kitchen energy use for about 33 years now. And I can't note, see anything. It's, is, am I the only one or is, are other people seeing the slide? Richard, anybody else? Nothing so far. Richard, nothing nothing so far. far. Okay, let's, uh, let's try again here. Well, Richard, so, if you can't get it up, I can get Paris to pull up your slides, if that's helpful. You know Let me try again, because I hit share screen, and this should be the slide. And how about it now? Yes, I'm sharing the screen. Y'all, you're good now, right? Okay, great. I see Chef Kumar nodding his head, two thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, I work at the Food Service Technology Center. We've been studying commercial food service, energy and water use for over three decades. And my email is at the bottom there, ryoung at frontierenergy.com. I only have a few minutes with you today. So please take note of that email and feel free to email me, contact me with any questions that you have. I'm always happy to help. I love what I do, deeply invested in it. So I wanna start off with something that is just a pretty much plain fact that we, we all sort of need to um, face. And in fact, I was actually on a uh, part of another virtual conference this morning, a thought leader conference with food service equipment and supplies. And, um, some of the top people in the country were just basically saying exactly what I'm gonna tell you now. So that made me feel better because it, <laughs> but the experts also uh, are following up. So here's, here's really the bottom line. Uh, most commercial kitchens have really not changed since the 1950s. Um, that's when we really started building these great big uh, um, sort of monolithic kitchens, very primitive cook lines. And they've been very functional, but they but that really hasn't changed much since the 50s. And what that means is that we're here in the year, you know, 2020 with kitchens that are still uh, relatively dangerous. A lot of fire hazards, still plenty of kitchen fires, still plenty of burns and injuries, and it's still somewhat of a challenge to manage our food safety. We could manage our food safety uh, much better. We also have kitchens that are extremely wasteful. I don't think I can think of any other industry out there that waste quite as much energy and water, commercial industry, that waste quite as much energy and water as our commercial kitchens. Um, at least 50% of the energy and water that people uh, purchase 
is wasted and the number is probably more like 75%. And that's rough. If you threw away half the food that you purchased, you would be right out of business. But we do that all the time in our kitchens. Our kitchens are also uncomfortable. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that would, you know, argue with me on the fact that they're too hot and too humid. And here we are in 2020, once again, we're connected to everything. We have smart, um, you know, meter, smart thermostats in our homes and our cars are smart and everything's smart. And yet our kitchens are still pretty much 1950s dumb in most situations, particularly um, when you get to the restaurant level, the independent restaurant level, uh, there's very little smarts, very little connectivity, knowledge, data gathering going on in your kitchens. So if I had to compare our commercial kitchens right now to, you know, make an analogy compared to something else that you can sort of put in your mind, it would be, a, you know, an early 1960s pickup truck. It's the job done, you know, <laughs> um, but they're dangerous. No seat belts, metal dashboards. Um, they guzzle energy. They were very uncomfortable vehicles and they have no smarts whatsoever. And you know, if we compare where we are in the, in the vehicle world in 2020, now we're looking at these amazing all electric pickup trucks, which are much safer, certainly all of the braking, all of the systems, all the airbags, you know, it's night and day from the, the, from the 1960s vehicle. Energy efficient, incredible miles per gallon when you convert the electrical usage, very efficient. They're very comfortable. Um, and they're smart. That, that truck is connected to the net and it's also giving you all kinds of feedback. You know, how, how much battery do you have left? How many miles can you go? All um, adaptive cruise control, all of these things that we've come to just love in our modern vehicles and accept. So, you know, that really is where we are. So if I keep all of those, you know, um, bullet points there, I can just sub in our old uh, you know, food service equipment and compare that against our more modern food service equipment. In this case, I'm comparing a gas range against an induction cooktop. And the gas range is an open flame. It is dangerous. Uh, it is very energy inefficient. It throws away 80, 90% of the energy that you buy is thrown away. It's uncomfortable. Lots of radiant heat spilling into the kitchen. It's not fun to sit there and saute in front of these, and it has no smarts whatsoever. Now, on the good side, it will last probably a thousand years. <laughs> but I still see some of those old, you know, Chevy pickup trucks, but I'm not going out and buying one, um, you know, and but yeah, and, and they're held together with coat hangers and stuff, right? It's compared to our induction, which is safer, no open flame, easy to clean, super energy efficient, uh, in the 85% energy efficiency range, comfortable because there's less radiant heat making it into the space and no heat making it into the space when you take pots off of it. And they're smart. They have controls that are very precise. And like a lot of other equipment, if you need to hook it up to um, some kind of monitoring in the building, it's much easier to do it with this, with this modern equipment. So that's kind of where we need to go. So as I, since I started talking induction, let's just keep along the induction line. I just, I just have to um, cross one first line here and tell you that induction cooking performs better. This has been a question um, on a lot of people's minds. Will an induction range keep up with a traditional gas range? And the answer is yes, it keeps up. It actually heats up faster. Uh, it's more efficient. It's, pretty, it's putting more of the energy right where you need it. It's more precise. And Induction is really a disruptive technology. It's very much like our smartphones in that it is going to change the way that we think about kitchens and we think about production. So uh, everybody out there has probably seen tabletop induction. This has been around for a long time. You've seen these in, you know, you go to get your omelets at the hotel on a Sunday morning and they're using the tabletop induction. So that one, um, Pretty standard, although what I can say is some of these pieces of equipment have gotten better and better and more precise over the years. So there's some very, very good, fairly powerful tabletop equipment. But uh, probably the more important thing for the people on this call is the fact that we now have uh, standalone um, range top, full range top induction equipment available. 
two burner, four burner, six burner, eight, you know, whatever you need, you have the, the full complement to run your kitchen uh, completely with an induction cooktop. And then there are some things that you cannot do with traditional uh, gas ranges or, or other holding, which is um, do some drop in. You can drop these into a countertop in spaces that might not traditionally be usable. And uh, you know, that allows us to do more with less space in our kitchen, which is where we need to go. And then there are also stock pot ranges and which are you know, relatively light to move. They actually don't weigh very much, but they're extremely powerful. I used to do a lot of uh, boiling of pasta water in the Italian restaurant on the stock pot range. <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty miserable experience. And the, this uh, stock pot range would reduce that heat and increase the performance quite a bit. And then there's a whole suite of interesting uh, induction cooking and holding equipment. Uh, everything from you know, marble top counters that, where the induction is underneath it to your basic soup warmers, all of which are, are performing better, um, reducing your food waste and cutting your energy use. It is a win-win situation. So we're proponents of induction. Now, right about this time, people tell me, um, well, Richard, the wok is the big problem. Um, you know, you have to have a traditional gas wok. There's no induction wok. And, and I come back and I say, well, you know, I kind of had that same notion until I went. This, I took this photograph in Shanghai in 2013 at a massive conference called the Hotel X Conference. And I saw lots and lots of induction woks. So that, that changed my mind a bit about the availability. Um, here's another photo I took. At Hotel X, I, I took quite a few. Here's, here's a couple of the best ones. This is this is the cook line that uh, just warms my heart. I, it probably costs a little bit, but it certainly is beautiful. But it it it's all of the things that you could want in one cook line. You've got your wok, your range top, your stock pot range, all available. And this was 2015, and and used regularly in in Asia. Uh, at the 2019 National Restaurant Association. As I was wandering the floor, I found this company, Pantene, which is importing an induction wok into the United States. And our facility, the Food Service Technology Center, has actually purchased one of these woks. Um, within another week or so, we will have it in our facility in San Ramon, and we have the capability to do virtual demos during the COVID uh, pandemic. So we'll be able to link uh, interested parties in through our ceiling camera. You can work with our consulting chef, Mark Dusseler, and, and actually see how these work. But uh, the good news is this piece of equipment exists. It's in the United States, you can get it now. And I believe that simply asking for it will also spur other companies like Montague and Garland and other players in this area to very quickly start introducing it. It really is up to the end users to ask for these. And you may say, well, Richard, um, the traditional wok has a great big flame and it's very hot. And I think that that's the only way I can go. And I wanna show you a slide that we actually created 20 years ago. We did research on woks 20 years ago. So on the left side, you see a traditional gas wok 100,000 BTU per hour, and it has an efficiency of 19%. And what that means is if you buy a dollar's worth of energy, 19 cents made it into the, the wok, right? Into heating the vessel and the oil on the bottom. And it could produce about 124 pounds of food per hour. On the right, you see a, a five kilowatt tabletop induction wok. And as I'm saying, this, this, this was one from 20 years ago. Its efficiency is 84%, so if you buy a dollar's worth of energy, 84 cents is making it into the, the wok pan, the food that you're cooking, and it can produce 117 pounds per hour. So it's almost identical, even though it is a smaller tabletop, it has the same horsepower, the same production capacity as the full-size wok on the left. So once again, that's good news. Induction performs really well. So let's get back to our kitchen of the future. We need to build this kitchen of the future, which means we need smart, high-tech equipment that's going to utilize uh, new equipment like combination ovens and rapid cook ovens. 
And while some of you may have dealt with combination ovens or seen them in past, everybody has seen a rapid cook oven. That's what Starbucks has used for years, the Turbo Chef oven, um, to quickly heat food. So this is a new technology that works really well. We need safer, faster equipment. We need induction cooking and holding. We need to also, in order for food service to survive, and even before the pandemic, um, all of the conferences that I went to where the thought leaders, they're all saying that food service has to move to off-premises dining. And that means you need more um, holding, you need more um, different techniques for cooking like cook chill and sous vide, things you may not have used in your restaurants before or you may have used in a limited way is actually going to help you stay in business, increase your customer base and make more money. And from a standpoint of design and effectiveness, it is easiest to do this cook line, these modern cook lines, all electric. You, some of the benefits, you only have one system in the building now. I have one panel, one main incoming line, one thing to uh, work with. And once again, I want to say, as I'm moving forward here, that I'm not against gas equipment. I'm looking into the future. I'm thinking of, I'm a restaurant in San Francisco. I'm really not going to be building that restaurant for several years. I'm moving into the future. How do I move forward and create the kitchen of the future? And that's where the all electric makes a lot of sense to me. Um, also, we know that gas prices are going to shift. We do not know exactly how or why, but I can tell you that utilities um, are trying to start trimming their gas systems because we actually have a little more infrastructure than we need and there will be fewer users. And so we do feel like uh, the market analysis tells us that gas could become more expensive. Um, one other thing that, that's often a question mark is um, which pieces of equipment last longer and which ones are cost less to um, repair? I have seen um, reports produced by the gas industry that says gas equipment lasts longer and reports produced by the electric industry that says electric lasts longer. What I really like is to hear from the end users. And two of my um, close chain operators who I've known for quite a while have both told me that in their experience, they got a longer life and a lower cost of maintenance out of their electric equipment. They actually like it. And then a third operator has moved all electric because it has allowed him to do some really interesting equipment um, uh, variations that you could not do with gas. For instance, he's put fryers on top of uh, refrigerated base, which you could not do otherwise, and, and it saves him a lot of time and money. And then, of course, with all electric, you could end up with a zero carbon kitchen. So our goal is to replace that traditional cook line that's, that is big and has one of everything with something that's much smaller, where we get more production, more flexibility in a smaller space, and where we actually need less labor. And once again, that I have nothing against the back of house staff. I'm not trying to get rid of labor. I just know that one of the biggest challenges right now is that you can't get anybody to work in the kitchen. So we know we have to do, and we know real estate's expensive, so we have to get faster, smaller, and more flexible. So let's, let's just look at a case study here. This might be our traditional cook line, uh, sort of one of everything, the gas range, the gas stock pot, a griddle, a steamer, holding cabinet. And I would like to replace that with a smaller lineup of more high efficiency, um, high tech equipment. And I'm gonna go right from my sort of uh, typical cook line to my all electric line. So my typical cook line would be mostly gas, with a couple of electric pieces of equipment, the steamer and the holding cabinet. And this would be a, re a relatively small to medium sized independent restaurant, the kind that you would see in San Francisco. And this restaurant, the, the carbon bill, the carbon emissions per year would be about 37 metric tons per year of carbon release from this cook line. And this cook line is gonna cost me almost $12,000 a year to operate. $11,800, almost $12,000 a year in electricity and natural gas. If I think outside the box, change my equipment, design and build my kitchen of the future, I can now get down to the point where my kitchen is, my kitchen is only emitting five tons of carbon and it's only costing me a little more than $9,000 a year to operate. 
and that is based on the, the electricity that's coming right now through PG&E's pipes and wires. So that means that I'm saving 32 tons of carbon per year, and my cost has actually gone down by about $2,400. And if you were in a, uh, an area where you can get, or you were on a plan where you have um, zero carbon electricity, of course, then you would be a zero carbon kitchen. And the good news is I have actually cut my labor cost and I have increased the safety of my kitchen and I have increased the flexibility of my kitchen. I can actually change menu items and I can get more repeatability out of this cook line with the same cooks. This is really where the kitchen of the future is going. Now, how do you choose equipment? You're saying, oh my goodness, Richard, you engineer, techie guy, you just expect me to fly down and you know figure this out. Um, we want to help you. There you see our consulting chef, Mark Dusler. Um, we have sponsorship from PG&E and have for many years to help restaurant operators, pg and customers with their equipment choices. We have a lot of training please contact us. We want to help you learn these things and help you move towards the kitchen of the future. And with that, I want to say thanks. And I believe I'm turning it uh, either back to Cindy or over to uh, Chef Kumar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard. And um, we will have plenty of time for questions for Richard at the end. Um, so please save your questions. But right now I would like to introduce uh, the vendor Kumar. Um, he is a previous restaurant owner. Um, he used to be the head chef at Stanford University Dining, and he now heads a consulting firm that creates customized culinary pro uh, programs and supports the development of new restaurants and trainings for chefs. So now we're going to hear a little bit about cooking in electric kitchens. The vendor? Thank you, Ms. Cynthia, and great, great information, Mr. Young. I'm pretty, pretty impressed with the, with the information you provided. And, and this is coming straight from a guy who actually spends 13, 14 hours a day on a regular day basis, seven days a week sometime in a week in the kitchen. And uh, before I get to the depth of what I have done in, uh, over the year and where I have been, I wanna talk about the little journey when I grew up, what were the kitchens like and where I was and how this whole journey started. I was born and raised in Northern India and uh, started uh, multiple restaurants. But before that, my education was in uh, pharmaceuticals and I came to this country, fell in love with the culinary, fell in love with the way things were done. And from there, I had an opportunity to work for uh, Stanford University for a decade and uh, managed a multi, multi-million dollar worth of a dining program, multi, multiple dining, along with the building and be a part of a lot of the communities within and designing a lot of the kitchen spaces within what we did. After my journey with the Stanford, we founded a, our consulting firm named Endure.com. You can find a lot of information about us at www.endure.com. Now I travel all over the nation. Uh, my major partners are uh, high ed and high production kitchen and and I believe in uh, I believe in uh, three things and as my partner or my very good friend chef Rochelle would say that, that we stand for three P's and those three P's are definitely the people definitely the planet and most importantly at the end of the day is the performance and how do we balance all that? And let me take you on a small journey of what I have seen in the kitchens, where I have been in the kitchen. And this is, I'm talking about my lifetime from starting in Northern India to where I am today. So I have seen actually this kitchen where mom and pop or, or grandma would cook right on a clay stove with the coal, with the wood, and she would blow straight in there, lot of heat, lot of, lot of carbon emission, lot of, lot of smoke within that space to when this thing changed to a kerosene oil back in the early 80s to when LPG came became a new normal and 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 all of a sudden we thought that that was the best thing happened since the sliced bread as we would say here and from there obviously I landed in a commercial kitchen with full of equipment I had a kitchen that had a tandoor that used to be like 700 degrees temperature within the kitchen space. You walk in there, you never need to go back in a sauna again. So 
So I worked in those environments and then I landed in a kitchen in a Stanford University. All of a sudden, all of a sudden I realized that as an industry, I think there is a lot of opportunity for us to learn, a lot of opportunity for us to change, a lot of opportunity for us to just make uh, embrace the changes and make adapted to the new things. And uh, what I always hear is like there was a great recession, then there was a great a depression and now there is a great adaptation right and we are in a great adaptation phase and uh, and nobody adapts better than the restaurant industry and covid-19 is an experience or example for that rather that what we have been able to adapt in that thing one thing i learned over a 20 plus years of my career in a culinary is there's a two type of a people in our industry Either you are process oriented or you are product oriented. So either one of you are, I salute you, I commend you, but I personally am a product oriented, not the process oriented. At the end of the, the day, I want to spend less and less time in the kitchen and more and more time doing things I love other than cooking, which is again my passion and that's the reason I picked that profession over my pharmaceutical background. And for us, this is a great example of a product orientation. This is an actual picture of a tandoori chicken getting cooked in a rotisserie oven. So if tandoori chicken needs, doesn't need to be in a tandoor all the time, it's just are you a product oriented or a process oriented? It's the most juicy chicken you can ever imagine cooked in a rotisserie that the same rotisserie that does a Costco, Walmart, and everybody else's chicken for five bucks. I can put that piece of equipment in my restaurant and make all those hens and birds and the chickens actually sell for a lot more than a $5 per piece just because I had the beautiful marination and beautiful, uh, beautiful spices to go with it. So we all need to understand either you can be a product oriented or you can be a process oriented. If you are a product oriented, I think you can make your life a little bit easier. You can think the things through a little bit differently. You can, you can go through a process, make your life a little bit better. And maybe all of a sudden 13, 14 hours a day is not 13, 14 hours a day at all. Maybe it's a little bit less than that and you can get to do the things that you love. As Richard was saying earlier, that the things are changing now and how do we cook these days? I mean, from a, from a clay pot to a kerosene oil stoves to LPG to a kitchen that had all natural gas equipment and the tenders to, a, to a maybe changing into a hybrid model where 50% or 60% of the equipment that we use were electric and 40% were gas based. And now this is how we are using, this is how we are cooking. You were saying earlier, Richard, that uh, you have seen uh, that where space is a money and a rent are so expensive. I have been a part of a kitchen that's only 108 square feet of a cooking space. Tilt skillet, combi oven, and a blast chiller. That's it. And that's all you need. Means most of the high production what you need, and that kitchen feeds about 1,500 to 1,700 students on every meal service means talking of the rotisseries, talking of the induction tops, talking of the small ovens, even the Evo, the, I'm, not, I'm not promoting any of that. They came up with the electric flat top that actually is a self-sustained and has a, has a ventilation system built within. We can do actually catering within a catering space where the guests are and we can do a tapanyaki right in the middle of the room just because there is the electricity there, just because there is a ventilation system within. So no smoke from present within and it's doing the job that any tapanyaki grill would do. A lot of our production is happening in these days and uh, those, those bulky steam kettles are no longer bulky steam kettles. Those are electric kettles that produce a very, very well result we are able to produce close to 90 to 100 gallons of any two things in a less than 35 to 40 minutes within that big piece of equipment. And great thing is that the, nobody has to pick up the parts, take it to the part washer, have, have them wash. They're still sitting there stationary, kill those bad boys, get all the product out of those ones, 
wash those things there and go for the next thing all over again. And, and productions for a 2,000 to a 35,000 meals a day is happening within the, within the marvel of the electrification and modernization of the equipment. And I think, I think the no industry knows the adaptation more than we as a chefs or we as a culinarian. I think this is a time for us to actually not even grab the torch and start running with it, with it, but also be a part of the movement, part of the process, and a part of the part of the whole change or adaptation, as we were talking earlier. And by the way, in a kitchen space, right? We are we are so afraid of the word electrification. But our kitchen, 70% of the things around are electric, aren't they? Look at this stuff. Isn't it all electric in our kitchens at all? Talking about the holding cabinets to our bar mixer, to our hovers, to our rice cookers, to our carving station, or uh, slicers, or juicers, or pressers, or a barista machine, or turbo chefs, to our salamanders, to a Vitamix, to our panini grill. Aren't they all electric to start with? So if that's the case, if this is what we have been doing for so long, then the technology where we started with a clay stove to where we are today, I have a no doubt if we can make a leap and a bounce within the trucks to a electric truck, that's the direction we are moving in the kitchens as well. And it's all for good. Is it going to be the exact same? same feeling that we had when we were when we were taught in uh, uh, culinary schools and the answer is no because nobody in a culinary school taught us how to use the electric stoves or electric induction stops we were taught on a real fire by a real me our next generation what not to do anymore and if we are continue to teach our kids that this is how we cook they go in an industry and now all of a sudden the, all the equipment and everything is entirely changed I think we need to start our start our thought process in that thing and this is happening again cooking for a lot of people is some is some joy for some of us some is a chore for people who spend 13 14 hours a day in the kitchen it's a lot of work. Technology can be baffling. Things are changing rapidly. If you like to see only the turn on and off knob, and that's what your bliss point is, then I have a good news, my friends, that things are changing. You are going to get a benefit of a turning on and off knob, yet having an induction cooktop, yet having a smartphone attached to that cooktop, yet be able to control every single thing while you are doing your bookkeeping and accounting and other things and when to turn on and off those things with the marvel of uh, electricity along with, the, in, in, uh, along with the technology added to it. And then again, as Richard was saying earlier, there's a lot of myths around the cooking appliances in general, especially cooking, electric cooking. I think those are just the myths. They may or may not be true at one point, but again, electric cars weren't true 20 years ago or 15 years ago. We have made such a leap and a bounce of a progress and adaptation and evolution. And we have evolved over a couple of decades and let this progress or let this path continue to change our lives. And maybe we don't need to spend that much labor on that, much, that many people within that space or we don't need to rent 3,000 square feet of just a cooking space anymore. So it's all adaptation, it's all product orientation, it's all changing the way we think, learning the way we were taught and relearning it, reimagining it, and, and making it better for all of us, right? And again, learning curve is going to be the only way how this magic is going to be happen. And we can all learn together, we can all be a part of this change. And my humble request, if you have any questions in regards to what would, what would a wok cooking or Indian cooking would look in an electric kitchen, oh, there is, a no, no, there is a no change whatsoever. The flavor profile, 
we talk about the tradition and traditional cooking. My tradition and my traditional cooking was in a clay oven. And now I'm serving uh, Indian food to tens and thousands of people. If I want to go back to 40 years ago and start cooking those clay ovens, maybe in nostalgia, really, really good for that. Not, not as a greatest business practice to feed a 30, 40,000 meals a day. And one of my clients, actually multiple of my clients actually feed a 100,000 plus meals a day between breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a 33, 34,000 students. Going back is not an option for a lot of us. Moving forward is going to be the option. Bring in a smarter and smarter equipment, bringing bring in it more and more advanced technology, making an ease of our liver. And one of the greatest things, one of our kitchen, our call out went down since we actually electrified our kitchen. People don't, people don't cough or, 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 or inhale those fumes anymore. 70 or 80% efficiency is in there. You are able to capture so many things with the marvel of a combi ovens, with the marvel of a tilt skillet, with the, with the cattle. We are able to accomplish more and more in less and less. And that's exactly, that's exactly the evolution needs to have. And we need to have a less and less people doing a, more and more work but with an, more and more performance and more and more efficiency and this is this is a, this is a moment this is a revolution let's become a part of this one and again as uh, richard was saying earlier stir fry wok cooking indian cooking any ethnic cooking is changing let's let's be a product oriented not the process oriented steam cooking sous vide there's so many things we are still doing with the electric appliances or the gadgets anyway so let's have them make our life a little bit easier, make us learn for the betterment for a lot of good. And again, people and planet and performance still stays on top of my head and I'm gonna to continue to do that. And obviously, excess heat and indoor pollution is another big topic we can keep talking. I have actually, my own son has asthma. He cannot work in the kitchen when we had a, a kitchen that had a hundred degree temperature and now it means if he walks in, in the kitchen has an ultra sham then I also have a combi ovens and I have a chill skillet and stuff just nothing no problem whatsoever so obviously there is a correlation where I'm going with that things are changing things will be different there is going to be the change is hard it's always been but at the end of the day we all are very very nimble we adapt to new things we learn new things and and new things hasn't stopped us to do a multitasking and I guarantee all of us that this is gonna stay the same way and we're gonna we're gonna adapt to the new things and we're gonna realize that we were spending 13, 14 hours to do whatever we were doing. We don't we really don't need to do that anymore. And what's coming obviously there's a lot of technology aspects are happening. Uh, as Richard was saying earlier, there's a lot of platforms and a lot of conferences are showcasing a lot of equipment that can do a very, very phenomenal thing, Vox and electric tandoor and, uh, and technology built within the new appliances and, uh, and, uh, and uh, adaptation to the smartphones and uh, be able to cook while you're not at work. If this is going to be the change and uh, more and more efficiencies and more and more performance in that sector. Uh, electric kitchens within the commercial spaces are happening as we speak, 108 square feet of uh, electric kitchen can produce a 1500 meals per meal service a lot of training kitchens and a cooking school are adapting to those technologies and are changing right from the beginning and the foundation hasn't been is getting built appliance vendors and uh, and people like uh, richard are the ambassadors to teach you the, the where to do what to do how to do and uh, and how to leverage the knowledge of uh, collective knowledge of uh, hundreds of years of uh, research in, within their space that's going to play a huge role in uh, the way we think and the way we thought about the things differently. And, and to just to close, join us and let's go electric green together. That's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Savinder, and thank you, Richard, for two great presentations. Um, so